it, the title is, Is It the Media or Is It Democracy? <laughs> and in this, we will be examining the degree to which our contemporary democratic dysfunctions are actually being driven by changes in our media ecosystem. I think we have heard some interesting uh, arguments for and against this already, and I look forward to hearing more. To what extent do these dysfunctions owe to factors that have very little to do with journalism? How much is the media responsible for the polarization? And how much is it simply reflecting it? So there are sharply divergent takes on this, and in this panel we're bringing them together in debate. I will introduce our panelists briefly since you have uh, further information in your programs about them, but Heather Hendershot, who will speak first, is Professor of Film and Media at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. She is the author most recently of an excellent new book entitled When the News Broke, Chicago 1968 and the Polarizing of America. Her essays have appeared in The Nation, Politico, Washington Post, among other forums. Next to speak will be Zach Gershberg, who is a professor of journalism and media studies at Idaho State University, also the author of a very contemporary cutting edge book that he co-authored entitled The Paradox of Democracy, Free Speech, Open Media, and Perilous Persuasion. He is currently at work on a new book project examining the press clause and journalistic freedom. Third to speak will be Mustafa Akyol, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., a senior lecturer here at Boston College, a longtime practicing journalist as well, opinion columnist in the Turkish media as well in the New York Times. He is the author of Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom, and Tolerance, and he is one of my favorite internet brawlers. His books have received praise in a wide range of publications, including the New York Times, National Catholic Reporter, and he has been translated into many languages. And the final uh, person to appear on our panel will be um, appearing as an apparition on the screen, uh, Pippa Norris, who is a comparative political scientist and lecturer in comparative politics at Harvard's Kennedy School. She is the founding director of the Electoral Integrity Project, she has received numerous professional awards and published around 50 books, including In Praise of Skepticism, Trust But Verify. On this panel, we, have, we are very lucky to have um, active researchers who are currently involved in these debates, uh, and I'm very pleased to hand the floor over to the first of our speakers, Heather. Great, thank you. Um, could you bring up my slides, please? Great. Aha. All right. So um, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I just reiterated the, the questions that we were given as prompts to prepare for this panel. And I am going to circle back to these questions, but I do want to start with um, a kind of a history lesson that I think will uh, help us think about mistrust in American network TV journalism. And I always like to be very specific. Part of what I'm doing here is a call for specificity when we say journalism. What kind of journalism do we mean? In what context? In what country? In what time frame? Um, so I want to take a quick look at uh, what happened in Chicago in 1968, which is the topic of, of this. Where should I point? I think, there we go. Um, of this book that Jonathan just referenced. Um, and think about how mistrust in media was weaponized after this famous event and beyond and some of the long-term <laughs> ramifications of that. Um, what am I? I think you, you just need to point it the other way. I had it backwards. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so a key takeaway from the book is that one result of this convention in 68, and for anyone who needs some backstory on this, there was a, quite a bit of violence in the street, and the media came under attack immediately afterwards, and also during the convention. And one part of the fallout was the nationalization and mainstreaming of the idea of so-called liberal media bias. So before the convention, there was a general idea among most people in America that network television news was pretty fair, pretty neutral, strive for objectivity, Sometimes they made mistakes, sometimes there was controversies, but the sort of default was a, a fairness and this went with their professional norms. And the people who thought that there was bias typically was uh, 
Because people who were pro-segregation in the Deep South, who didn't care for the television news coverage of of the civil rights movement, and people on the far right, whether they were extremists in the in the sort of style of the KKK, or whether they were in the John Birch side, or even someone like William F. Buckley, they took as a given that the media had a liberal slant. But otherwise, the sort of mainstream idea was that they did, did not. And after the convention and during, uh, that became to, began to change very radically. And so this notion became sort of mainstream and nationalized as opposed to being regional and more of a kind of niche or fringe idea. Heading into the convention in August of 1968, um, we have a number of anchormen up in the booth, all men, um, and we have Walter Cronkite, who uh, is uh, you know, sometimes referred to as the most trusted man in America. One of his nicknames is Uncle Walter, seen as a very trustworthy figure. And then over at NBC, we have Huntley and Brinkley. And you can get a sense of the gravitas just from this slide. Uh, Chet Huntley smoking his pipe in a very distinguished way and so on with the golf logo as their sponsor in the middle. Uh, the convention starts, and immediately there is violence. Um, both on the convention floor, where Dan Rather is famously slugged, um, but also uh, out in the streets. And this is a, 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 a classic image from that moment where a New York Times photographer is being beaten. And it's a, it's a perfect iconic image of this moment in some ways because look at how overwhelmed he is. The ratio of so-called security forces to protesters uh, in Chicago in that week in August in 1968 was about two to one. You have 10,000 protesters and 20,000 police, uh, national guardsmen, CIA, Secret Service, agent provocateur. Um, so they're radically outnumbered. And the uh, police and National Guard are targeting and beating and tear gassing protesters. But they really are targeting journalists. If you have a camera around your neck or you're prominently displaying your press credentials, it's like, kind of like having a bullseye. And they're going after them. Um, of course, the most famous moment is the so-called Battle of Michigan Avenue, uh, most famous because it was fully captured by news cameras, 17 minutes of police beating protesters in front of the Chicago Hilton. Um, and it filled American TV viewers with anger. How do we know that? Because they deluged the networks with telephone calls and telegrams all night. And then following the convention, letters came in for months and months afterwards. And so they, the anger was not so much against the police, but against the network news. And the a typical way of uh, framing this displeasure with what the news had done was, you know, you shouldn't have shown this. And basically, if you were going to show it, you needed to, to tell the story better. So imagine that I'm holding a camera. I'm a network news person in Chicago. The critique was, look, you just looked right here, and you took a picture. But if you had sort of gone this way and this way, gathered more footage, you could have told a better story and you could have shown how, in their words, the protesters deserved to be beaten because they had provoked the police. And what you did was you left out that story of provocation. Um, so that was the immediate fallout of dramatic increase in the level of distrust in network television news. Our survey two months later found that 32% uh, of Americans felt that police had used the right amount of force in Chicago and 25% not enough force. So we have over half of Americans very much siding with police and uh, by extension against the media in Chicago. So it's a key moment of distrust in mainstream media, sort of pivotal moment. Um, afterwards, Nixon and Agnew really weaponized this idea of liberal media bias. And it's an idea that is sort of a seed that takes takes root and it grows, it continues to today as an element of the culture wars, even as many things have obviously changed in our media ecosystem. Um, so it's a tipping point, but as I just said, the ecosystem looks very different today. We've moved from a mass media environment, which uh, uh, Ron Suscon was referring to as this moment of drinking from the same fountain just a few minutes ago. Uh, we moved from mass to niche, uh, from legacy, so-called legacy media to social media that's very uh, carefully targeted. Um, and what I find fascinating is the issue in Chicago was not just one of sort of left versus right, because you had people telegramming and phoning and writing letters who some identified as liberal, some as conservative. A lot of them said, I'm not, I'm a centrist, I'm a moderate, but I'm really angry at the media. <laughs> um, uh, and it was an issue of, you know, trust. There's a big difference between saying, wow, you really could have told the story better, and saying, you made up the story. 
it's fake. So the first version is definitely negative, but it is there's a submerged optimism implicitly there that this problem could be fixed as opposed to if everyone's just lying, you, you cannot fix this problem. There's no way to, to make it better. Um, a recent survey found that about tw uh, only 26% of Americans have a favorable opinion of the news media, which I would not have been surprised if it had been much lower than that. So that's where we got to from here. Uh, from there. Um, so to get back to this earlier question, to what degree are contemporary democratic dysfunctions actually being driven by changes in our media ecosystem? The media e ecosystem, and really importantly, how it is monetized, is a driving force. It's ultimately, I believe, bad for democracy. But within this context, some media sometimes can do work that is good for democracy. So I feel like we always need to be specific and not just talk about journalism, the media, but more specific instances. Now, I have a few examples here of the negative side of what I think is, is troubling in the contemporary ecosystem. In print journalism, we have the drive for clicks where, you know, the basically AI is measuring uh, people click through, uh, people's click through rates when they look at an article or they go from a, a homepage further within a publication, and it's not about reading, it's about just clicking through. And of course, this is encourage, encourages the most uh, sensationalized headlines and also often very misleading or poorly done headlines. Not a new problem in journalism at all, but one that is exacerbated by um, these automated systems, by AI. Um, in social media, you also have the AI problem, the automation uh, of the amplification of emotional and especially negative responses in the social media realm. And then in television journalism, we have a little tag covering up my text there, but what I basically say is we don't have that automation problem. We've got uh, the issue of people wanting good ratings, but I think more importantly, if you're looking at cable news as a strong polarizing force, <laughs> Um, the issue is cord cutting. So, you know, Fox News does not care for, say, a boycott uh, against my pillow, right? That's not necessarily good for them financially or for public relations reasons, or it might be because sometimes they want controversy, um, but they don't really lose that much money on it. Where they are in danger of losing money is if people uh, stop getting cable. So uh, that's, you know, they're going to produce more and more ex uh, excessive polarized content, a uh, polarizing content to keep people from wanting them to be dropped from their cable packages. Um, I don't know what's happening now, so I will just look at my notes at the end. Everything has disappeared. That's all right. Luckily, I'm an analog person and I printed this out. Um, okay, so the final question, to what degree do today's democratic dysfunctions owe to factors that have very little to do with journalism? The dysfunctions have a lot to do with journalism. But what kind of journalism contributes to dysfunction and how? Again, it's a kind of call to specificity. How can we be critical of journalism without scapegoating it with a very broad brush as we saw in Chicago in 1968? And I find it's useful, and I'm going to conclude my comments here, with, to set up a series of oppositions between different mediums and kind of think about what's going on in terms of dysfunction and polarization and democracy. If you contrast newspapers to cable and say the Washington Post to Fox News, um, the Washington Post of course has certain journalistic norms where they're striving for objectivity, balance, and that sometimes has a negative result uh, in terms of what we uh, decried as uh, both sidesism during the, the Trump years and beyond, whereas Fox, of course, is not trying to talk to both sides in that way at all. Um, and so, like, they're, they're both making mistakes um, if we just look at them side by side, but different kinds of mistakes. But then what if we contrast cable to network? Uh, television. I think that we often speak about like television news is terrible today, but we're often talking about cable news and not network news. And the difference between 24 an ecosystem that runs 24/7 versus a news system that is on the air for one or two hours a day. So in the 24/7 system, you're desperate to have enough content, and that is a natural ecosystem that encourages opinion reporting, commentary, and of course this becomes punditry uh, very, very quickly. And network news resists that to, some, to, to a large extent and still theoretically embraces the ideals of the network era and the sort of Cronkite era in many ways. Um, 
another opposition is sort of between newspapers and magazines. And I held up the New York Times versus the Atlantic to think very quickly about the issue of polarization and to give you a really specific example. I recently read an interview in the New York Times with Paul Ryan. Um, and it was aggressively neutral. It was like the reporter did a very good job of not asking too many challenging questions, <laughs> of just letting Paul Ryan say what he had to say. And one of the things that he said, he was trying to convey himself as a very regular, not extremist kind of Republican, implicitly as a potential nominee in 2024, which I think is kind of pie in the sky, but that was what I think he was up to, jo avoiding a lot of jingo, except that, jingoism, except that he said that Americans are suffering from a polarization fatigue. I mean, I'm tired, but I don't think that that's accurate. But the reporter didn't push back. They were just like, well, those are his words. That's the idea he wants to convey, so we're just going to let him say that. Meanwhile, a few days later, I get my new copy of The Atlantic, and they've got an, you know, an excellent, deeply researched piece on extremism and violence in America showing absolutely no fatigue whatsoever when it came to polarization. So it points to the, the kinds of reporting that are enabled in a environment striving for neutrality versus an environment in which someone can, can actually take one side and, and push it harder. Where does this lead, and I'll close with this question, where does this leave local television and local print news, which are really, really struggling? Um, Local print news, as I'm sure most of you know, in the past 10 years, 25% of local newspapers have shut down. And we know, we have very strong data that uh, communities with local news have a higher rate of civic engagement, a higher rate of voting, et cetera, than communities without those newspapers. And when the newspapers go away, things shift in a, in a bad way. And where does that leave us? And I'll leave you with the quotation to tell you exactly where that leaves us from the uh, Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, next up will be Zach Gershberg from Idaho State University. Oh, as, as you wish, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Who is using Chrome? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Who's using Chrome? As we're waiting, I'll just say that I had a chance to read Heather's book, and it's really good, as you probably can. And you should Thanks. definitely uh, <laughs> check it out. Sorry to use this pre-time as a plug. <laughs> Yes, uh, so I enjoyed the peanuts. were very salty. Did you have salty peanuts? Oh, it's simple. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sure how to. We may be on the verge of it. Can they just play that? Ta-da! 
Thanks a lot. Shall I? Huh? I keep on thinking we're stable. This is what democracy looks like. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It's always imperfect. It's a hot so mess. I suppose <laughs> I should. I have this really bad joke. I suppose I should get out of the way now. This is what democracy looks like, but that garish orange slide is also what a university rebranding effort <laughs> with forest templates looks like. So uh, that roar where the Bengals out in Idaho, and uh, you can't even delete it. It's like just, <laughs> it's just there. So, but you know, the, the marketing folks said, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna highlight the orange and uh, was, I'm giving you the orange. Uh, so, so I, I can go? Awesome, great. Okay, so now that that is, is out of the way, I don't have to um, spend, spend too much time. But, but I will say, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, my book and what we were kind of interested in, I, and I do wanna talk a little bit about democracy itself, um, it, it, because we've been struggling to define like journalism and objectivity in a lot of these different terms, but, but I do think it's important to clarify what we mean by democracy, and that was, that was sort of a goal with the book, and like what we're experiencing now, democracy dies in darkness, like, oh, whatever will happen to us, but in some ways what we've been experiencing, I think, very much is what democracy looks like, the existential danger and vulnerabilities that are there, is kind of something that courses throughout the history of democracy uh, from the Athenian experiment to today. Can you click it? Um, so the, the classical understanding of demo or practices of democracy, uh, really we, we highlight uh, the centrality of free speech. Uh, I think this isn't the, there should be one before it. Yes. Okay. So in 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 Athens, around, so they had a Greek term, isagoria, which which referred to the um, uh, freedom and equality of speech. They had parisia, which meant uh, talked about the bold sort of truth telling of speech. But what's interesting about democracy that I found because there's different governments and there's different rights of voting or sometimes not ex excluding votes, which we know all too well. Uh, as Americans, so throughout democracies, what they have is a form of free speech in terms of the government permitting uh, citizens and politicians uh, to communicate freely, but then also you have throughout democratic history, media innovation. And so Plato, uh, his works, one, he's, he's really upset and resentful that his mentor Socrates um, is basically um, uh, convicted, right, and drinking the hemlock, and so almost all the dialogues can be read as a kind of way uh, to get back at that. But then also, right, uh, the cultural innovations and media innovations uh, within Athenian society, from um, the, the use of an alphabet to uh, the dramatic theater to sport, uh, these cultural things that accompany even our society today. But I think it's also dangerous Right, free speech. Um, uh, there's a danger, right, that I'm just a free speech bro, you know, you know, calling everyone else out while being completely hypocritical myself. And and so, what's important, I think, it's it's so telling, right, that in the 1890s, because speech and press are very different things, and yet we've gotten all caught up with them being together. And I think it's in, uh, uh, re really fascinating that Ida B. Wells, that, that we've mentioned a few different times uh, uh, over the last day or so, uh, her newspaper in Memphis, which we ha no longer have copies of, was called the Memphis Free Speech. And uh, the other newspaper in town, uh, said that we have, our, our white patience has gone on too long, get her. And they basically burnt down uh, her, the, her building and all the, 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 the copies. But I think it's interesting that at the same time, over in France, uh, the most notorious anti-Semite, uh, Edouard Drummond, who, who led basically the, the Dreyfus Affair, uh, his newspaper means, the title of it was Free Speech. As well, so you have the ultimate crusader for justice, exposing the ills of lynching and, and, and various problems in the South, Ida B. Wells, who I think really should be under recognized 
as the, the first real muckraker. I know that's like the next decade that that, that, that comes in, but it's, I mean, um, is, is remarkable. But then, right, we have Marjorie Taylor Greene, free speech matters, and free speech does matter, but maybe not for the sense that she's in, invoking it, right, that I could do whatever I want. And, um, and, and so I, 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 I appreciate the, the carefulness with which we would need to uh, look at this. So just the classical, and you know, this is what democracy looks like. Democracy provides this sort of open culture that allows, in terms of potential energy, right? Citizens can use their voice uh, without being suppressed in theory. Um, and in some ways, that's prior to even the act of voting. We sometimes think democracy, it's voting first and then all these liberal rights. But in some ways, free expression is an actual democratic right, not a liberal right. Um, and, and so what I put here was with the asterisks, it can limit uh, concentrations of power and tyranny as well as oligarchy and economic concentrations. However, that's just the potential. From Athens to today, um, you would like to see it happen more, uh, but there's no guarantee. And that's something that we see uh, over and over again, but in the age of liberal democracy, which begins, I think, cracking up, uh, as, as, as uh, Heather pointed out in 1968, but the idea was it was a centralized culture, right? There were constraints on access to mass communication, and so there were norms and gatekeeping, and it highlights institutions, and it was all so functional. I'm always asked, like, why do we have such a dysfunction in democracy? How could we just get back to passing compromise legislation and things like that. As if, I, I sometimes, it's like that 80s song, let's do it for the norms, like is that, is that why we're, it's, it, instead of the boys, like is that why we're doing democracy? To have just compromise and norms? Um, I, I don't know. So this obviously cracks up completely, it feels like in 2016 with, with uh, uh, Trump and Brexit, but I mean it's, it's also, um, kind of, I think we're in denial that that age is over and we want to just go back like the characters on Lost in season five. It's like if they could just go back to the island, they'll have meaning in their lives. And for a lot of people within journalism, I think there's this idea if we could just go back, there, we, 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 we'll, we'll do better this time. And what, unfortunately, there's, there is no going back, at least not to that. So. That's why we'll move on in terms of slide. So I, I can't really make sense of this. This is a, an Egyptian dissident, Allah Abd al Fatah, who um, is uh, serving, had been in and out of jail for over the last decade. Uh, he had a hunger strike last year. Um, he's been convicted of false news, but he's a former computer software engineer. Uh, and it's a really fascinating, I mean, he's, he's been jailed by um, uh, right uh, 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 for, for various different Egyptian governments, but he, he writes in a really clear way about media, but I've chewed this over for weeks, and I don't really know what I think about it, so I, I just wanted to put this out there, because I'll tell you what I think about different things, but it's very strange that the entire world knows that these tools and mediums are defective and they have no faith in them, they're suspicious of them, but they just keep using them. And I don't know what to make of it because you would think a jailed, imprisoned dissident might see hope in it. But in some ways, he doesn't, he uh, provides his own sort of hope, right? The title, You Have Not Yet Been Defeated. And so there is a message of hope, but it's not necessarily coming through our platforms. Okay, so let's look at a few theses I'm working with on, on media and journalism. One, the media does not exist. So I'm sorry to object to the. The, the questions in the panel, but we should not use the media in a singular term. And it is, uh, in, uh, ver there are various different media that do different things that are products of economic, technological, and cultural content production. Um, and so it is basically unhelpful and grammatically incorrect to keep saying the media is blank. Um, so I also think we've reached the end of an era, um, not an epoch, but an era. Um, and, and, and really since the 1840s with the, the, um, the emergence of the telegraph and photography, we have the use of speed and velocity in communication in terms of speed and direction and then also the image from photography to cinema to television uh, and advertisements. And so I think we're ending and I think even the, the, the raid or the, the run on the SVB bank was maybe the, the last 
hurrah on that, hope, maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So, um, so I think we've reached the end of that era of the last almost 200 years. And, and some of the AI things that we're seeing, I, I don't know how much we're going to have that's new about images or uh, speed in terms of technology. Okay. Um, another thing is journalism can spark democracy. We saw that in the American and French revolutions and others throughout. However, I, I, I do want to be clear, and I really admire the work. Uh, Jay Rosen has been mentioned a few times. Uh, journalists like Margaret Sullivan is great. But don't we shouldn't kid ourselves either. Journalists couldn't save their own field. Um, their own uh, uh, industry. I do not think that they're somehow going to save uh, democracy. However, um, and I don't mean that in the spirit of being a super downer, I think journalism, what it can do, what it is still capable of, is chronicling individual and public experiences, uh, as well as exposing economic and political corruption. But again, these are just, uh, th this is potential. Right? If they're doing nothing but infotainment uh, and, and, and uh, following their bosses, uh, and you know, you know it's, it's, it's not going to do those things. So what is to be done, right? This is the second time we've heard this today. It was the newspapers used it in Vienna uh, after, uh, b before the start of World War I. So it's kind of interesting. One, um, print and the power of place, I think, is incredibly important. Over a decade ago, the sociologist Clay, Clay Shirky said, society doesn't need newspapers. What we need is journalism. Uh, Nikki Usher, who Daniel talked about, uh, wrote about how place is the essential unit of political power uh, in the United States. And so as someone who lives in a high desert ecosystem, and we've heard some back and forth about news deserts, um, you know, to the jackrabbit and the sagebrush, the desert can be a very complicated, really rich uh, environment with which to live. And, and so I do think it's important, and, and, and maybe no one argues this anymore, but um, print actually can help. Um, and, and so I love this new state newsroom initiative that they have all over. So the Idaho Capital Sun is a new digital nonprofit journal. We, so we have good journalism, even in Idaho, but it doesn't necessarily change voting patterns. Um, it exposes corruption, but sometimes that doesn't actually have any lead to any legal accountability. And I think in part of what we should do, um, and, and this is what I'm, even though I was kind of catty about, uh, uh, journalist before the press clause, right? Uh, a little known fact, right? Citizens United, we all remember and deplored because uh, money is speech, corporations are persons. Well, little known thing in there, they actually severed the press clause. They said that the press clause is really just a redundancy of free speech. And so just like that, a very distinct, specific uh, right was taken away and it wouldn't be their last, uh, as, it, as it turned out. And so I think renewing the press clause and what that might mean, how we could get to new public media and what our rights as citizens to journalism, you know, we've been talking a lot about what does it mean for journalists, what does it mean for citizens to have access to it. And then the last one, and I do think newspapers to sort of play with the uh, <coughs> ecological metaphors. So wetlands, and when it comes to climate change, Wetlands, restoring wetlands, new wetlands, is not going to solve all of climate change. However, wetlands are these beautiful, wonderful uh, ecosystems that ab absorb carbon, uh, and they really help. I mean, uh, and so we often don't think about conservation efforts when we talk about environmental issues, and maybe I'm involved with some of them in Idaho, and it's actually really, really helpful. Um, and so I think. Now, there is a problem, right, with, with newspapers overall in their history, but they can serve um, as, as, as our wetlands. Um, but I think that's kind of an American-specific thing. And for my final, um, I thought this quote from Margaret Fuller as she's in Europe for the European revolutions, the struggle is now fairly thoroughly commenced between the principle of democracy and the old powers no longer legitimate. I think it was true then but it's true over 150 years later. I think it will continue to be true. Um, but that, that struggle just um, sustains itself, and there's maybe no decisive blow on it. But all right, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. You could go to the next one. That's, that's five o'clock. Thank you, Zach. Uh,
Next up is Mustafa Akio. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And the good news is that I don't have slides, so we're, we can take a deep breath. Yeah. Uh, and thank you again for the organizers for uh, hosting me. I feel at home on this campus now since I began teaching this uh, uh, this spring. Uh, I should say that it's been great for me to join this conference symposium because I've been learning a lot about the state of media in the United States, about which I know very little. So I will not speak to you about it because I'm not from the United States, although I've been living in this country in the past five years. I come from a different country, which is Turkey, which also has an interesting story about the media, a sad one, and I'd like to share a few facts about that and a few stories about that actually, which, which is still relevant, I think, to the broader discussion of freedom, media, democracy we're having today. And I should also say that I'm, I have not been an academic observer of what has happened to the Turkish media in the past 10 to 15 years. I've been rather a survivor of it, so I've gone through it. Uh, so it's a little bit of personal story too. Um, and I'll begin with that personal story actually. Until 2014, I used to be an opinion columnist in two different Turkish newspapers. One was in the Turkish language, the Daily Star, one was in the English language, Hurriyet Daily News. And I was writing mostly from a perspective of my lifetime, you know, ambition, Islamic liberalism, as we call it, like reconciliation, Islam with liberal democracy and the values around it. And Turkey was a fertile ground for those ideas in the first decade of the 2000s because here was an Islamic party heading towards European Union, realizing important reforms. So Turkish religious conservatives were interested in these ideas of religious freedom and free speech and equality, which were there a little bit in Turkey already, but you know they were contested. But then in the 2010s, the ruling party started to shift its direction. From the EU process, it got what it was, what it wanted, which is being saved from a secularist military. But then the, gradually Putin's Russia looked like to be a better alternative for the direction they want to go. And it became gradually apparent. And I became critical of the government that I used to support before, uh, especially after the Gezi Park uh, incident that uh, Professor Ver Jan Müller Werner you know, mentioned this morning. I mean, they, they, th these were anti-government protests that the government depicted as a global conspiracy against Turkey cooked up by Lufthansa and, and foreign secret services and so on and so forth. To me, it sounded like Ba'ath regime narrative about what's happening in the Arab Spring, like a foreign conspiracy. And I said, this is not a conspiracy, you know. And conspiracy theories are not the right tool to understand social phenomena. Uh, but one thing about conspiracy theories is that when you say there's no conspiracy, you become a part of the conspiracy. So that also happened to me too. Oh my God, this guy is hiding the conspiracy. And I kind of started to hear stuff like that. Ultimately, what happened is um, the prime minister of the time, who's now the president of Turkey, Tayyip Erdogan, he called my editor-in-chief in Daily Star and he said, you know, get rid of this Akio guy. Uh, my editor-in-chief tried to protect me a little bit, but it didn't help, uh, so I was fired. The editor-in-chief himself got fired a few months later too. So, I mean, it was just, everybody was on the line. So what happened is basically in, in just several months, the paper, which was not against the government before, but turned out to be a, like unabashed Pravda, glorifying the great leader and, and his success and, you know, and demonizing his enemies. But this was just one paper. What happened in, throughout that period, basically beginning from 2010 to today is the, let's say 10 major newspapers that the Turkish society knew and read, like Hurriyet, Milliyet, Akşam, Sabah, these big new papers that everybody knew, they were not always the best in terms of their you know, objectivity and, and accuracy, but they were kind of centrist new pa newspapers. They all started to feel some pressure. I mean, the big incident was one of the big media bosses, which owned many, some of these newspapers, and also CNN Turk, the C affiliate of CNN in Turkey, uh, one morning, tax inspectors came to the door and looked at their papers and fined the company a, a, a tax fine of four billion dollars, and and it just you know it was everything they owned basically. And 
Uh, so and there was a long time of you know diplomacy and and the owner was given the message that if you sell your newspapers actually you'll be okay and he decided to sell the newspapers and the people who bought the newspapers turned out to be uh, good friends of the president or pr prime minister at the time who also got the state contracts to build the new airports and you know support his lavish propaganda and all that so what to give you to to give you an analogy imagine like the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, all the major newspapers that you know in the US, plus CNN, and all of them changing into Breitbart, like in, in 10 years. And what happens is that when somebody buys the newspaper, the new boss buys the newspaper, what happens is the writers and editors and the reporters who are critical of the government are cleansed and replaced by the people who uh, sing the glories of the government and you know the evils of the conspiratorial powers that are targeting our country. Uh, so this is what happened within the framework of an electoral democracy. And uh, the government said, well, if you're unhappy with us, vote against us. Well, they still got the 51% of the vote despite this, partly thanks to this, because not everybody saw this as a problem. The government was selling that we are nationalizing these newspapers because they were before serving the f evil foreign powers that are targeting our country. And there was a whole international cabal of George Soros and elders of Zion and CIA and all that was together somehow. And these power and the papers were their fifth column. Now we are kind of nationalizing them. A lot of people believed in this. So. Today, Turkey's at the stage. Uh, also, there were other pressures on, on the newspapers. I mean, there is a law in Turkey, for example, which bans insulting the president. And more than 100,000 people have been prosecuted for insulting the president in the past 10 years. That means you say something against the president, not everything. I mean, you can get away with some respectful criticism still, but if you say, I mean, he's a dictator, uh, the police will show up at your door in a few days, which kind of prove the accusation, but you know they, they don't get the point. So, and then you know probably you will be taken to the police station, questioned a little bit, let go. But some people actually go to jail for a few years, and other people get the point. So, is this a democracy? Well, elections are happening, so this is a democracy. That's one argument. But it's it became an extremely illiberal democracy. So. There are elections in Turkey in a few months, actually. Now we are curious about what's going to happen because this is the first time it seems that the government may not have the 51, 50 plus 1 percent majority. But once that happens, what they will do about it is, uh, is a good question. And dream scenario is that maybe they will accept the results. Uh, the more scary scenario is kind of a January 6th Turkish version scenario, which would be worse in Turkey, God forbid. Now, I see three lessons out of this story. One is democracy is not just about elections, right? They insist it's just about elections, but it's not. The reason they insist, or Modi would insist in India, is that because if democracy is just about elections, it can easily devolve into the tyranny of the majority embodied in one party and embodied in one strong man. This has happened in Turkey, this is happening in India, it's happening in Hungary. There are people who want to do it in some Western liberal democracies. Maybe you have seen them. I don't know. So it, 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 we should be very clear about what democracy should mean, rule of law, media, and judiciary is here very important, I should say, because they go after the media thanks to the fact that they get the judiciary in the first place. If the judiciary becomes subservient to the executive, the executive can use it to send tax inspectors and to you know, put people in jail for insulting the president and all that kind of things. The other lesson is, well, I think this to me shows that journalism still matters because they're going after it. <laughs> I mean, they, they want to get those newspapers. What's funny is that once these newspapers have been transformed into different versions of the same Pravda, as I call it, actually they lost a lot of their uh, sales. I mean, they became less interesting and important. People stopped buying it. That's why when you go to Turkish Airlines, you know, you'll get all of them for free. You know, you can get them. Which is still a good airline, by the way, regardless of the politics. I mean, I don't, it's not against Turkish Airlines. But, uh, but it doesn't matter. The, the very fact that the newspaper became less influential is not important. They defanged it, right? 
Now it's seeing the glories of the great leader. Not, not everybody believes in the big lie, but still there's no voice out there. And there are, are there some independent newspapers in Turkey? A few, yes. But I know what happens to them is that when a company gives them an advertisement, they can get phone calls from Ankara saying that, why are you supporting the traders and so on and so forth. So they're struggling. And uh, we'll see how it goes. But it, it matters, that's why I go after that. And, and I think it's important to understand this from a perspective where you have meat journalism in a, in a free country. Imagine that it doesn't exist. That will make a big difference. That's why they want to co-opt it and, and, and destroy it. One more final lesson is that this Turkish tragedy uh, didn't happen out of the blue. It, it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened in a long historical context. And that is this big century-long culture war that has defined Turkey since the 1920s. Uh, what basically has happened is that Turkey has been divided into different camps. There's a Kurdish and Turkish tension, and, but the big co tension was between the secular ruling elite versus the unwashed masses and the religious conservatives and the religious reactionaries. The secular elite, I'm not saying secular liberal because they were secular and illiberal. <laughs> And they did wrong things like banning headscarves and entering into the campus and so on and so forth. So that built a grudge. But they looked down upon these religious reactionaries and the deplorables. You know, they, and Erdogan has been surfing on that. And that polarization ultimately came to a point where one side of that polarization defeated the other side and conquered it, and it's still conquering. Which is something I came, which came to my mind when I was listening to Jamil yesterday. He gave a fascinating talk. You know, he told about this media history in the United States. He said, in the 19th century, we had a very polarized media. They were like against each other. It was against each other, conspiracy theories. That was like Turkish media before Erdogan. Then he said, you know, we went to a nicer period where it became more objective and civilized and nice. So now we were going back to the old days. So these are different options, but I'll tell you, there's one more scary option. If it is like this, one side might ultimately win the war. And if they win it, they can go like revengeful and, and crushing and so on and so forth. And whoever that side is, it's not going to be good for the country. That's why I believe in diffusing the culture wars as much as we can. It's going to be there, but let's try to keep the good old values of having a civic culture, some institutions that are independent, some factual reality that despite our agreements we can agree on. Uh, so sometimes people say liberal democracy is boring. I would say I want that boringness, right? Because I've seen how the alternative can be. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mustafa. The final speaker on our panel um, will be a virtual speaker, Pippa Norris, uh, coming to us live with some luck. So thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talk listening to these panels. Can you see my screen so you can see things moving? Jonathan, can you see oh, my screen? Hello, Pippa. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for joining can us. I think we're going to see you in a moment. And I would just ask you to please um, keep, keep to the time so that we have um, some room for discussion. Sure. Thank you. And can you see the screen now, the uh, slides? In 10 seconds. OK, perfect. Let me know when. We see it. Marvellous, thank you. So it's a pleasure to join everybody on the panel. And so far we've had presentations on American media, as well as on Turkish media. And I'd like to put this in a broader context. And think in particular about trusting government and trust in democracy and the role of the media in that particular process. So what I'd like to do is just firstly, briefly talk about the theory and challenge some of the assumptions about trust being necessarily beneficial. Talk about the research design, the data, the evidence, the results and the conclusions. This is all from a new book which came out in the fall. 
And what I'm going to argue today is essentially the following points. Firstly, trust in the media or in government or in any of sorts of authorities can be beneficial. It doesn't have to be. What we want to focus on is not trust, but trustworthiness. And from the perspective of the government, from those who are in power and from the media and from other authorities, trust is always great. It brings people along with you. It induces compliance. But from the perspective of citizens, trust can be positive or it can be negative. And we can make the wrong judgments about trustworthiness. We can think, for example, when we look at Fox News, that there has been electoral fraud. Or we can think from political leaders that we should take Invectamin. Or we should think any other sort of message which is coming out from the government. But we need to be critical and sceptical. And there are two problems which citizens make in any democracy when they listen to the media and the messages. One is cynical mistrust. In other words, the election, for example, as everybody believes in 2020 and 2016, was, was accurate, was fair, efficient, and people don't believe it. They think that votes were stolen or that the election, electoral officials were partisan and so on. And that's a common problem. We're all very familiar with that. But there's another problem that we have really underestimated, and that's credulous trust. And that's believing uncritically the messages that we receive, the information which is given. And that's a problem in democracies when we're in media bubbles. And it's even more of a problem in countries like Turkey, but many others like Russia and Hungary, where the media is being silenced, journalists are being imprisoned, and there's no freedom of expression. And so we need accurate evaluations about how government works, how democracy works, how our society works. And this comes from two things. One is our cognitive skills, our information, our knowledge, our information that we can get, but also from the media and from press freedom. And in societies without press freedom, there's much more credulous trust about those in power. And what we need to do is not build trust, but government trustworthiness. It's competency, it's ability to deliver, it's integrity, it's honesty, and it's impartiality. And media watchdogs are vital for that. I'm going to present some evidence to demonstrate that point. So although there's a lot of cynicism, obviously, we need to think that the media plays a vital function in being the key intermediary between citizens and the state. Now, all of this is from the book. I won't obviously talk about the book in great detail, but I'll give a little bit from the beginning and a little bit of snapshot of some of the evidence as well in praise of scepticism. And I use the Ronald Reagan phrase, trust but verify, which he used for nuclear disarmament, but in fact can be used for any information we get. And there are many different ways of thinking about trust. I won't go into each of these. We can think about social trust, like the work of Bob Putnam, my colleague. We can think about trusting government and government agencies. How far, for example, do we trust medical authorities over COVID? How far do we trust um, any other authorities, for example, banking regulations? And we can obviously have trust also in the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and of course, in other countries. Do we trust Russia over Ukraine? And the conventional wisdom is that trust is a good. And there are many authors, I won't go into these, again, they're very familiar to every scholar, whether it's about how trust facilitates societal cooperation, how it sustains relationships, how it lubricates markets, Frank Fukuyama, how it undermines, how it's the basis of political legitimacy, rule of law, and all the rest of it. If so, then of course, if the media are excessively cynical, and people are cynical about the media as about government, then it's a problem. But let's reframe this. Clearly, this can be an issue. When we think about some of the current challenges that we know about QAnon, for example, whether we think about the advice to have invectment, which is right now uh, trending on Twitter, whether we think about, for example, belief in conspiracies like co uh, the Comet uh, Pizzagate issues, or of course, January the 6th. But in every case, I'm going to argue that cynicism can be an issue, but so can some credulity. And credulous beliefs, uncritical beliefs, people who are not insufficiently skeptical about the information they get is part of the reason why, for example, we get uh, conspiracy theories. So here's three arguments about where trust comes from. For some, trust is an individual characteristic. It's a fixed trait, like optimism or extroversions. We can be trusting or not trusting. 
Others argue it comes from where you live in society. Ron Inglehart, for example, my colleague, has said that it's all about whether you live, for example, in Peru, or you live in Sweden, you live in Russia, or you live in, for example, France or Germany. In which case you learn it from your society around you in your early years. But a third view, which comes very much from economics and from other disciplines, says no, trust is about performance, and what we need to focus on is trustworthiness. What I mean is here, should I trust in an informal social contract the principal, the agents, to act on our behalf in the expectation that we're going to have effective uh, services in our favour? Are they competent? Do they have integrity? Do they have impartiality? If, for example, I need a heart operation, should I trust the surgeon? If I need financial advice, should I trust the company to have uh, my interests at heart versus selling me certain shares? And when we think about government, if the government and the leaders make promises, pledges that they're going to do something, should we trust them to actually deliver on those promises? What have they done in the past? How are they going to act in future? Now, when I make those judgments, we can make them as positive or negative. So this is the typology, which I'll briefly mention, and then I'll show you some evidence as we operationalize this. So when I'm thinking about, do I trust the government? And should I trust, for example, PBS? Should I trust Fox? Should I trust the New York Times? I can be negative or positive. And the agency performance can be negative or positive. They can tell us information, for example, in the media, which is accurate and which is informed, and which is balanced, or they can give us propaganda and they can basically favor a particular partisan position. So when I'm positive towards the agent and they're trustworthy, that's skeptical trust. If, for example, governments um, work well in, in, say, Sweden, in delivering public services, and the public is very positive towards their government, they're informed about how it's performed, and they have skeptical trust. But you can also have effectively skeptical mistrust. So if I am in Russia and I'm listening to the news about Ukraine, I should not trust the state agencies. I should not trust the messages which Putin is controlling. That, for example, that Russia is in Ukraine because of Nazis and denazification. I should be really reading between the lines and mistrustful of the information which is given to us from official channels. And that's equally normative positive. If Fox News says that there's fraud in the election, but all the other information says, no, I shouldn't trust it. And so on and so forth. The interesting position is the other two. So if I don't trust the information, but in fact the agency is positive, if the agency says COVID works, the scientific evidence has been peer reviewed, you should take it for your health and your children and society. If I don't believe that, then I'm cynical. But equally, I can be positive towards the messages, but in fact, the agent is not acting in our behalf. The agent is seeking power, or corrupt authority. If I listen to Erdogan, for example, in Turkey, and he's giving certain messages, then there's a high likelihood that I might be credulous towards leaders, particularly in, in countries without freedom of expression, but in fact, they're not acting on the public good. They're dishonest, they're corrupt, or they're simply otherwise seeking um, to manipulate public opinion through propaganda. Now, if I if we take those four positions, how do we start to measure it? What's my evidence that this relationship actually can be tested? And therefore, the re relationship between the media and democracy can be tested. So my dependent variable, what I'm trying to measure, are judgments of trustworthiness. In any agent, it doesn't matter. It could be a social person. It could be a neighbor. It could be a state and a government agency, or it could be an international agency. And I should have some information about performance. And so we have indications, for example, about how far governments are effective in managing the economy, how far they have integrity and honesty, or are they scandal driven? Are they impartial or are they highly partisan? But all of that is through my own perceptions. It's not objective evidence. It has to go through what I believe. And that is going to be affected by my knowledge, my ability to sort out the information, especially on complex issues like COVID or Ukraine, or any other issue where it's a really difficult to judge trustworthiness, and above all by the information which is available in society. So in open societies where I have plural information, meaning more than one source, and now I'm not in a media bubble, where I have media watchdogs who basically 
train their lens on those in power and provide information which is reliable, and where there are oversight mechanisms, for example, in Congress, and when there's uh, basically cultural values which are critical. So that's the model which I've got about when we're going to arrive at judgments of trustworthiness. Let's think about the data and I'll give you some evidence to show how this works. My evidence is from the World Value Survey, which is, of course, the largest survey worldwide. We now have seven waves from 1981 to 2021, uh, over 115 diverse societies. So we have many, many closed societies uh, as well as open societies. And we have lots of measures from the very beginning of interpersonal trust, institutional confidence, including trust in the press and television, and trust in global governance like the United Nations. And I've added from a project funded by the ESRC new, new surveys in really repressive societies, whether they are in Iran or in Libya, in Morocco, in Myanmar, uh, before the uh, generals took over again, in Nicaragua, which is increasingly repressive, um, Tajikistan, Venezuela under Chavez, Vietnam, a one-party state, and so on. This is the coverage. Uh, as you can see, countries like Canada and Sweden, obviously, but lots of countries we cover in Latin America, in Asia, in Central and Eastern Europe. And I classify my societies into those which are closed and open, not based on the survey, but based on evidence from the Variety of Democracy project. So they look at freedom of expression very broadly, including media pluralism, alternative sources of information, freedom to be critical, and they give you a scale. And we've got countries which are highly closed, according to this scale, as well as being very autocratic. China, Tajikistan, Belarus, all illustrate that along with Russia, Iran, Thailand. But at the opposite end, and these are the countries in the World Value Survey, we have the Denmarks, the Finlands, the Netherlands, the Frances of the world, which are both highly democratic, according to liberal democracy, and have freedom of information. Now let's get to the actual results. Um, uh, these are the data for how I'm measuring trust, uh, but let's just say I'm going to focus on political trust, trust in parliaments, in governments, in parties, and so on. I need to measure the level of public trust in these countries. I need to measure the perceptions and the objective indicators of performance. And my measure of skepticism is the accuracy, if the performance seems good and the public trust correlates with, with it, then that's for me skeptical trust. Okay, the results. Now, I'm going to just show you one or two tables. I know they're awful to look at, but I'll just explain what they are and then show it to you in a data visualization, which is much more friendly. This is a simple classification which looks at a variety of different indicators about whether or not democracy is working in terms of basic economic and social indicators. These are things which the world has accepted as basic things that government should do, produce economic growth, economic development, reduce unemployment, have some level of economic inequality, have education, lower the homicide rates, produce longevity, maternal mortality rates, and so on. And we've got open societies, we've got between 25 and 40, uh, like the United States, like Denmark, like Sweden. And then we have closed societies, about the same number of cases, and we're looking here at the correlation at macro level, at societal level, between economic and social performance and how far the public has trust in government. Meaning trust in the government, in parliaments, in parties and the civil service on 100 point scales. If I look first at open societies, the simple answer is that yes, the better the performance of government in open societies, the greater the trust. In other words, trust is skeptical. The public is informed, whether it's on patterns of economic growth, patterns of economic development, the higher the GDP, the more affluent society, the greater the level of trust. The worse the rate of unemployment, the more negative the trust. Inflation isn't significant, but that's partly because it wasn't really that important as an issue in the period that I'm looking at. But look at income shares. The greater the economic inequality, in other words, the greater the amount of money for the rich, the lower the level of trust. The greater the level of economic equality, the, the more the poor are better off, the greater the level of trust. The same is true of secondary education. Homicide rates is negative, of course. Doesn't work for every single indicator, but it works for a lot. But 
In other words, just to summarize those figures, and I'll again show you a slide to, to illustrate this. The more the level of trust, the better the performance. The better the performance, the more the level of trust. But look at closed societies. And these are the Nicaraguas, these are the Vietnams, these are the Chinas, these are the Russias of the world. And there's no relationship at all between the performance of the government by these objective indicators from the World Bank and how far people trust their leaders. The only one that works is unemployment. None of the others do. Let me show you this briefly. And you can immediately see here we have the level of trust in government going along the bottom with the countries in red, which are the closed societies. And the per capita GDP, a basic measure of economic development in the in the vertical axis. And the green line summarizes the open societies. And you can see that where there are countries which have got high levels of economic growth and other indicators of good performance, the public is more trusting. These are the Switzerland's, the Norway's, the Sweden's, the Denmark's, the Netherlands, the Canada's, South Korea, Japan, France, Australia, different parts of the world, normally democratic societies as well, but characterized here as freedom of, of information. By contrast, the democracies which have lower information, like the Mexico's, which has really got all sorts of problems of violence and corruption, or Croatia, um, or Greece, or Slovenia, those are countries which are also democratic and where there's lower levels of development and lower trust in government. There are a few exceptions. Uh, but by and large, that green line summarizes the relationship nicely. But look at the red line. Those are the closed societies. Those are societies where journalism cannot shine a light on government corruption. And what you can see, and this is really important, in China, more people say they trust their government than in Sweden. Similarly in Vietnam, similarly in Myanmar, which is run by a military, military junta, or Indonesia, or Bangladesh, or Iran, with a theocracy or, or Thailand, which had a military coup d'etat or Pakistan with all sorts of problems of corruption, Ethiopia with the civil war. In those countries, there's no relationship between uh, performance measured here by development and trust. Well, you might say, and again, I'll just give you two more slides, Jonathan, and then finish, because I know we have to, we want to come on to our Q&A. Um, maybe it's not about performance as policy. Maybe it's about the quality of governance per se. Maybe it's about things like political stability, rule of law. Oh, sorry about that. But let me just summarize again. In open societies, we have measures which are, divide, are provided by the World Bank on the quality of regulation, voice and accountability, control of corruption. In open societies, there's a strong relationship between all of these indicators of how well government works as a process in 43 societies and how far people trust their government. In closed societies, there's no relationship except in terms of liberal democracy where it's negative. So it's not because closed societies may be more autocratic and also have less corruption or more greater political stability. No, there's no relationship between public trust and all of these qualities. And this again illustrates the dramatic contrast and the, ca and the categories here. So skeptical trust, in other words, where you should trust the government, are the countries in the top right quadrant, the Canadas, the Australias, the Estonias of the world. Cynicism is in the top left quadrant, which includes the United States, but also Chile and Cyprus and Spain and Portugal, Latin America, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Southern Mediterranean, slightly more skeptical along with some Latin American countries and some other new democracies like Romania and Croatia and Peru which has got real problems in terms of public protest right now, <coughs> there people are more cynical and also less trusting and they have a worse quality governance. And if you look at the patterns of the countries which are the closed societies without a free press, what you can see is that there's a lot of trust in their government, but good governance index are negative. In a country like Myanmar, in Bangladesh, public services are poor, Tajikistan, highly corrupt Vietnam um, and, and so on. And again, we have skeptical trust in many countries which are also closed. The Lebanon with a, a, a government where tremendous uh, disaster in terms of public services and, and, and 
um, lack of economic, uh, an economic uh, basket case, basically Bolivia, Mexico, um, Brazil under Bolsonaro, and so on. So summarized, um, and oh, with democracy, it's even worse. Uh, the more dem democratic, the worse the position in terms of close societies. So just to summarize, what have I said? Uh, again, these are the positions. Um, let's not assume that trust is good and mistrust is bad. It's a conventional thing. It's become so much part of our, our, our way of understanding the world for such a long time. And we have to say, no, we need trustworthiness, not trust. And from governments, of course, from the authorities, we always want trust, but not from the point of view of citizens. Because as we all know from MAGA, if you trust leaders who give you misleading information or lies, then of course, um, there's all sorts of dysfunctions, both for individuals who trusted, for example, and went to the January 6th, believing that there was fraud sometimes, honestly believing there was fraud, but obviously were mis being misled, but also in other countries where we can see, for example, trust in Putin, which has gone up after the Ukrainian out, uh, invasion, but is not based on any rational basis at all for the citizens who are losing, uh, uh, who are losing some of their young, young men as well as, of course, the invasion and the disastrous consequences in Ukraine. Erroneous beliefs are there on both citizen size and credulity. And what we need is cognitive skills, education, information, the ability to sift through complex information and open societies, media watchdogs who do uphold the best ideals of liberal democracy. And we need to build government trustworthiness, not public trust. We've got to strengthen competency, the ability of government to deliver on what it says it's going to do integrity and honesty and impartiality so that they focus in the public interest and above all the message quite simply is freedom of expression is vital and groups like amnesty international the committee to protect journalists international idea uh, and many other agencies who are seeking to build freedom of expression are vital particularly given the government given dem democratic backsliding which is the big picture as we know from the summit from democracy from variety of democracy and many other sources. So that's my that's my message. I hope that that was that was useful. Um, and uh, apologies if I went over long. And again, apologies that I wasn't able to join you all. Um, but I really hope we can have a Q and A. And I, I look forward to listening about the positions and, and views and Q and A. So I, I rather like the uh, analogy of the f scorpion and the frog. Uh, I think that yeah. it's it's useful for thinking about how we uh, make use of the latest technologies uh, and how they are sometimes uh, of assistance, but there is often a trade-off for, uh, there is no such thing as a free passage, let's put it that way. I want to uh, <coughs> just reserve a few minutes for questions since um, I, I don't want to um, eat into the next session result, but I, I, I wanted to give Jan uh, the chance to ask a question since uh, he had one on the tip of his tongue. Uh, and then uh, if you'll just bring him the microphone, we can, we can start. Thank you. Thank you for remembering. Um, for Heather, so very illuminating talk. Uh, one quibble and then very, one very broad question. Uh, the quibble is simply, I share the call for specificity. But isn't one implication that we should mistrust all these surveys which ask these very, very broad questions about do you trust the news media? The broader question goes back to your point about aggressive neutrality, as recently evidenced in this New York Times magazine piece. I'm just curious, maybe everybody else knows this, but when and why happened this divergence between the US and the UK? So the BBC, of course, in the old days was also very differential. Come the 90s, Jeremy Paxman asks Michael Howard the same question famously 12 times, you know, and more, more recent examples of a completely different attitude. And then, you know, someone like Mehdi Hassan comes over here and people feel like, wow, you can do this, you know. Why did that happen? What are the sort of the historical pattern that explains that divergence? Of the, um, between the US and the UK in terms of aggressive neutral. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how much I can speak to the UK model because my research is so American centered. Um, I, the, the quibble question I think is a very good one. And I, I, um, 
I completely agree that these sorts of, of surveys are uh, problematic and sometimes they are stronger than others. And of course, we know that public opinion is an invention. I was just teaching my undergrads this last night. <laughs> it's not the subjective thing that we find out there. We construct it by how we frame our questions and so on. And so, uh, you know, we always need to be thinking about what the survey methods were and, and, and so on. And uh, in the sort of longer version of this whole project, when I look at public opinions for, I mean, you singled out the, I think the uh, trust in media towards the end, that 26% figure um, that I took from a recent Michael J. Sokolow uh, article in the conversation. But uh, if you go back to the data about attitudes about the police and violence in the street and so on, um, that was from the University of Michigan. And so what I tried, what I did was go back and reread it and thought about what were the survey methods and so on and so forth. And um, I'm sure there's some flaws in there and the numbers aren't perfect, but one thing that's really interesting that has completely dropped out of the historical record that I'm trying to bring back in is that those numbers have been thrown around a lot for the last 50 years, um, but there's a whole separate set of numbers that is specifically uh, uh, black respondents to the survey. And the numbers are radically different, like 82% overall uh, said that the police had used too much violence. And so trying to like bring race as a really important issue back into how we think about what happened in Chicago in 1968, which has been mostly left out because it's just been seen as a white event, that which in many ways it was in terms of street protest and African Americans sort of staying away. Um, so, uh, 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 agreed, <laughs> you know, that, the, that these numbers need a lot of work and unpacking. Um, and I think the key thing is just to go back and, you know, look at how they were achieved and, you know, guardedly, uh, I don't know, trust but verify, <laughs> guardedly um, use them with a sort of with a grain of salt. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else in the audience like to pose a question to our panelists or would any of our panelists like to comment on uh, anything? May I ask a yes, question Mustafa, to people? Um, is China turns out to be the country where you have the highest levels of trust to the government. Could it be partly because people would be scared to say, I don't trust the government? Like, is it how genuine would that be? So you've got censorship and self-censorship. Censorship is where the state will ban um, people who are, a bit, who are critical of the government and throw them into prison and so on, a very well-known tactic. Self-censorship is where you're being asked in a survey and you basically don't express an honest view because you don't know where the person is coming from. Maybe they are an authority themselves um, in government. What we can do is we're trying to disentangle these two elements. And we're trying to use list experiments, which are one of the best ways for, for trying to work out whether or not a public opinion is authentic on these very sensitive issues. But of course, this applies to any survey question on socially sensitive issues. If you ask people about sexuality and if you ask people about um, corruption in their, or bribery, for example, they're also subject to self-censorship. You won't get a, an honest response. And we have to basically try and triangulate as well and look at a variety of different sources of information to try and work out is it is it true or, or not true in all of these, in, in any survey response. And think critically about um, what the respondents mean and how we can frame things in ways which don't cue them um, in, in a very clear direction. Um, can I just come back on the BBC for a sec? And, and, um, mentioned that essentially the BBC, the idea of how critical um, Jeremy Paxman, for example, has been on the BBC is nothing new. Um, that goes a long tradition that goes right back to Dimbleby. Uh, and I think what, what's most fascinating is the tradition of having balance automatically across parties in the UK television, where basically every single representative for every party is normally represented in any round table to comment on any issue. And there has to be balance across them versus the United States, where basically journalists talk to other journalists very much on, on say, PBS or in other uh, things like network news or on CNN. So there's just a very different culture in how public broadcasting has evolved in Britain to how it's evolved in the United States, just as there are very differences in the newspaper market, where the New York Times is much more balanced. And in Britain, it's been much more partisan in terms of newspapers. So um, there are mirror opposites across the pond in some ways. Thank you, Pippa. I think that I'm going to have to call time on this panel, wow. but I, I hope that we can continue the conversation uh, in between uh, and beyond. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists before.